coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. There's a lot of great recipes out there for fish and game, and we've collected a few of our favorites to share with you today to hopefully inspire your next meal. It smells great. You can smell the herbs, the olives. It smells really fresh. It goes really good with that fresh snapper that we pulled out of the gulf. But I like to cook it really, really hot to develop a nice crust on the outside. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Hello, I'm Emmanuel Salas with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and our Community Archery Program. Hunting and fishing are wonderful ways for you to provide local, sustainable, and nutritious food for you, your friends, and your family. Good shot. Harvesting your own meals takes some preparation, but it makes the food and the experience that much better. What a nice one. There's a lot of great recipes out there for fish and game, and we've collected a few of our favorites to share with you today to hopefully inspire your next meal. Now let's get cooking. Hi, I'm Jesse Griffiths and this is Wild Game Cooking. Today we're going to be cooking some feral hog. Feral hogs are really common in Texas these days, uh, pretty much overpopulated. They give ranchers and farmers fits, but there is a good way to deal with them. Uh, what I've got here is a feral hog shoulder, or actually a small piece of a feral hog shoulder. It's about two pounds. This could come off of pretty much any part of the pig, the ham, the shoulder, and this will feed about four people. So what we're gonna do today is make some tacos out of this by cooking it really slow and low in the oven in a heavy pot with a lid. I like to cook this overnight, maybe eight to 10 hours. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna season it with a little mixture of salt to taste, some pepper, a little bit of brown sugar to add just a touch of sweetness, and what I've got here is a little bit of chipotle powder. This is a smoked and dried red jalapeno. I like this stuff a lot, so I'm gonna put it in there, but it is very spicy, so use your discretion. A little bit of cumin, ground cumin, and a little bit of dried oregano. I'm gonna mix all this up. Possibly add a little more salt to that. And I'm going to rub that into the shoulder. Just evenly distributing it all over this cut, like so. Once I've got it pretty much rubbed into the entire muscle, I'm going to add some onions to my pot, and then some garlic cloves. Those can go in whole. They're gonna cook for so long, they're pretty much gonna melt by the end of this. So I'm simply gonna set this on top of there. Like I said, this is extremely simple. Put the lid on and put it in the oven. It's gonna go in the oven overnight. And then tomorrow, I'm gonna to wake up to tacos. So we're gonna put this in our 225 degree oven overnight. Texas has more hogs than any other state, about two million. These pigs are actually descended from hogs brought over by early Spanish explorers. The rooting is very destructive and causes about $500 million worth of damage each year. Despite efforts to eradicate them, their population continues to grow and expand, and they're moving into urban areas. In fact, there's one in my oven right now. I love waking up to that see how it looks. That looks great. Nice and tender, shreddy, just falling off the bone. Really easy way to cook feral pig right here. So I'm just gonna make my tacos, kind of shred a little meat off, mix that around in that nice juice in the bottom made with my onions and the spices and the garlic. Load that up on a corn tortilla. And we're about to get messy. I like to serve this with a little bit of guacamole and maybe some pico de gallo 
but feel free to use any salsa or other garnishes that you like to serve with your tacos. Enjoy. Mmm. That is really good. Really tender, spicy, really nice. Barrel hogs might be a nuisance, but they sure do taste good. Today, we're gonna to be grilling a venison backstrap or loin. Venison is a really lean, really flavorful meat. I particularly love it. I'll shoot two or three deer each year and that'll usually last me up until the next season. Because it's so lean, sometimes it can overcook and become a little bit dry. So I like to grill it over really high heat and put it in a marinade. First, what we're gonna to need to do though is remove this membrane right here. If we leave it on there, it'll curl on the grill and it won't lay flat. And this is also pretty tough. To get this off, I'm simply gonna hold it with my thumb and move a knife right along it, kind of scraping, kind of cutting the whole loin off, like so. There's a little bit left on there. I'll just come in with my knife, trim that off basically until I don't see any more white membrane on there. Now that I've got the silver skin off, I can put it back in the bowl and I'm gonna season it up with a little bit of salt and pepper. I like to season meats before I grill them for maybe two hours ahead of time or maybe even a day. This allows all the seasoning to penetrate all the way through and makes them a little more flavorful. I'm also going to add some fresh chopped herbs I've got some rosemary, thyme, and oregano in here, but feel free to use anything you've got on hand. And then some olive oil. I'm gonna toss that to coat it evenly and then let it sit, like I said, two hours or even overnight. I've got a piece over here that I've had marinating and I'm ready to go on the grill. I've got a gas grill over here set to high. You can also use a charcoal grill or even wood. Let that burn down to nice hot coals, but I like to cook it really, really hot to develop a nice crust on the outside while the inside stays nice and rare. And cook it about five minutes per side. Yeah, that is a nice hot grill. Texas has more white-tailed deer than any other state, but only about 15% of the herd is harvested every year. You'll feel the center, you do the same thing. The way you handle the meat in the field greatly influences the taste. If handled correctly, you can avoid any unpleasant gamey flavor. I think the best way to store venison is to vacuum seal it in plastic bags for the freezer. So I've taken this off the grill, let it rest for about 10 minutes. It's nice and tender, looks great. I'm gonna slice it thinly like this, still pink on the inside. I'm gonna make a really simple sauce to go with this now, just a horseradish cream sauce. I'm gonna start with a little bit of sour cream or creme fraiche. And to that, I'm gonna add a little bit of horseradish. I'm gonna start with about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more if you like it pretty hot. Mix that in there. I'm gonna add a little bit of lemon juice and a little bit of lemon zest and some chopped chives. You can also use chopped parsley. Mix all that up. This is a great simple sauce that goes really well with grilled venison. I've also got some grilled vegetables to go with this. Perfect, simple meal. This is it. This is the culmination of the entire process. The hunt, all that preparation, butchering, preparing this. This is my favorite part. Hi, this is Jeff Martinez with El Chile Cafe and Cantina in Austin, Texas. 
Today we're gonna to be doing some wild game cooking. We're using Dove today. It's a lean, tender, dark meat. We're making a buffalo dove breast with a celery and carrot salad and a blue cheese dressing. Let's get started. We're gonna take our dove breast, we're gonna dredge it in the flour. Make sure you coat them all over. This flour is gonna help the buttermilk stick to the dove breast. Here's the buttermilk right here. Right in there, make sure they're coated all over with buttermilk. And then right back into the flour. The buttermilk's gonna help the flour stick to the dove breast. Make sure they're evenly coated with the flour, just like so. All right, then we're gonna go straight into the oil. You want your oil to be at 375 degrees. That'll give you a nice brown, crusty coating on the outside while cooking the dove through. While those are cooking, we're gonna go ahead and make our salad. So we've got some celery, some shaved carrots, a little bit of red onion, and I like to use all of the vegetables, so I've got some celery leaves here from the top and some buttermilk dressing to finish it off. Toss that around. Make sure you coat all the vegetables with the dressing. And that buttermilk dressing will take away some of the bite of the buffalo sauce. All right, there we go. Let's check our dove breasts. We're gonna pull these out of the oil. Take them right to this paper towel to drain. So this dove recipe reminds me a lot of when I was younger my pop would take me dove hunting right outside of San Antonio at the family ranch. After the hunt, we'd all sit around and kind of tell stories and stuff. And I always had something to look forward to every year. That was dove season. Take them. Oh, we just missed them. So these dove breasts look like they're ready to go. I've got my homemade buffalo sauce here. It's a mix of sriracha, butter, vinegar, a little Worcestershire sauce. I'm gonna throw these right in. I'm gonna mix them up, make sure I coat them evenly. And I'm gonna go ahead and put them on top of the salad. And then I'm gonna finish it all off with a little blue cheese. So this is a new twist on an old favorite, buffalo wings, and it's also a great way to end your dove hunt. Buen provecho, y'all. There are more ways than ever to help Texas Parks and Wildlife protect the outdoors through the Conservation License Plate Program. More than $9 million has been generated from the sale of these plates, funding wildlife research and big game restoration, protecting native species and their habitats, studying fish populations to improve Texas fishing, how do you like that? Improving Texas state parks through reforestation and other projects. We got one. Yes, yes. Go. Every plate on a car, truck, trailer, or motorcycle means more money to support wild things and wild places in Texas. Today we're going to be grilling some teal yakitori. I've got two whole teal here, and I've also got a couple breasts from a teal. Teal are really nice little ducks. I'm always happy to see them coming into my decoy spread. They grill nicely, they also roast nicely. The way we're going to cook them today is to skewer them and grill them. We're also going to cook one whole on the grill. What I'm going to do is slice this breast into nice big pieces like this. And I'm gonna alternate on the skewer that I've had soaking in water with the white part of a green onion, like this. I'm just gonna keep going until I have a nice little skewer made here. We're gonna put a little bit of oil on these and put them on the grill. And we're also gonna take this whole duck that's been plucked very nicely and the backbone's been removed. And we're gonna flatten it out a little bit like this so that it lays flat on the grill. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil on that as well. And we're ready to go on the grill. We've got about a medium fire on this grill over here. I'm gonna go right on there. And now I'm gonna baste these with a traditional Japanese yakitori sauce. This is something that's used for grilled poultry. It's really nice, especially with wild duck. It's made with soy, honey, 
a little bit of fresh chopped garlic and a Japanese rice wine. And I'm gonna baste these continually throughout this whole process, glazing them while they're on the grill. This makes all those mornings in a freezing duck blind seem a lot more worth it. Every fall, millions of ducks arrive in Texas after a long migration from the northern Great Plains. There's nothing like the spectacle of that first group of ducks coming in in the morning. Dixie! There are a couple of things you can do after harvesting to make sure your meat stays fresh. You wanna get this little fatty part. First, dress and cool your ducks as soon as you can after leaving the field. Then, when you get home, leave the skin intact and freeze in containers filled with water or vacuum seal them to prevent freezer burn. And these are ready to go. These look really great. I like to serve the yakitori with a little bit of thinly sliced green onion, a few slices of pickled radish, and a little more of this great sauce on the side. These ducks came a really long way to get here to Texas, and it's best to treat them right. Hi, I'm Jeff Martinez with El Chile Cafe and Cantina. Today we're gonna to be making a red snapper ceviche. This is a red snapper, pretty common off the coast of uh, Texas. You can also use a mahi-mahi, or you can use a black drum, which is what we use at the restaurant. So I have some red snapper fillets with the skin on here. I just wanna take that skin off. You can use just about any kind of uh, white fish for this dish. You just want something with a firm flesh. You could even use salmon if you wanted to. You just kind of want to stay away from stuff like mackerel or something that's a little too oily. So I'm going to slice this into some bite-sized chunks. This recipe came from a, a fishing trip that we took when I was down at the coast with some of the co my coworkers from the restaurant after a long week. We had uh, gone out deep sea fishing and got some snapper and decided to make ceviche out of it because it's probably one of the most simple dishes you can do. So I've got my fish in the bowl here and I'm going to go ahead and add some lime juice and some lemon juice to it. Add that right in. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of oregano, that's gonna flavor it. And then a little bit of salt, right on top, and I'm gonna mix that up. And I'm gonna set that in the fridge for about six hours, and that's gonna give the lime juice enough time to cook the fish. So while that's marinating, I'm gonna go ahead and make a green herb puree. It's gonna add a little bit more brightness to the ceviche and a little bit herbal flavor. So right here I've got some cilantro, some parsley, and some mint. You can use just about any herbs you want to. You want to stay away from the stronger herbs like rosemary and sage. Chervil works fine. Dill is great also. I'm going to add a little bit of garlic and a little bit of jalapeno for kick. And you just want to kind of puree that until it's kind of a uh, fine pesto kind of consistency. That looks good. As far as getting out and catching red snapper, some of the best spots are near wrecks, oil rigs, and artificial reefs. Oh, you fish with the pros, guys. There are close to 70 of these artificial reef sites in Texas. You can search for the ones closest to you on the Texas Parks and Wildlife website. So we're gonna get our fish out of the fridge. Oh, this looks great. Now this is what you wanna look for. You want kind of some whiteness to the flesh of the fish and you also want a little bit of firmness. I'm gonna go ahead and drain the fish, drain the lime juice marinade off of it. We're gonna add our fish to the bowl. And then to that, we're gonna add our green herb marinade. And then to this, we're gonna add some green olives. It's gonna give a little bit of more salt to it. And a little more lime juice, just to kind of bring back that lime flavor from the marinade. Some jalapenos for a little kick. A little onion. And I've also got some cucumber here. And the cucumber, the uh, onion, and the jalapeno, they're gonna add a little bit more crunch a little more texture to the dish because the fish is still a little soft. I'm gonna mix this up, just like so. Now this is a great appetizer. You can be served before a meal or it can also be served as a hearty snack. This smells great. You can smell the herbs, the olives. It smells really fresh. It goes really good with that fresh snapper that we pulled out of the Gulf.
Then I'm just going to go ahead and finish it a couple of slices of fresh avocado. That's going to add a little bit of creaminess to the dish. And there you go. A red snapper ceviche verde. A perfect end for your trip to the Texas coast. Hi, I'm Jesse Griffiths. Today, we're gonna fry a redfish. I've got a really pretty redfish down here. Nice size. I would love to catch something like this. I like it for its really firm texture. It's got a really clean flavor. I've got some fillets already here, and we're gonna fry those three different ways. The first one I'm gonna do is gonna be a mustard batter that we're gonna also roll in breadcrumbs. We're also gonna do a very traditional cornmeal batter and then a beer batter as well. So the first thing we're gonna do is take our filet and season it with a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And then put it in the flour. I'm gonna use my left hand to put it in the dry ingredients so my hands don't get coated with all these batters. This mustard batter has got a lot of good acidic flavor from the mustard. It's got a little bit of beer in it, and then it's also rolled in breadcrumbs, so it's got a really nice crispy texture. And just toss to coat, like so. Next, I'm gonna come in and season with salt again, and pepper. And we go into my cornmeal. I like to use really finely ground cornmeal for this. That helps it stick a lot better. And then since we're doing two coats on that, that's gonna give it a really nice crust. Into the egg wash, just beaten egg and milk, and then back into the cornmeal and coat that really nicely until we're ready to fry. The last one, again, salt and pepper on each side. And then we're just gonna dip it right into a fairly thick beer batter, like this. We're all ready to fry now. I'm gonna come over here to my oil, which I've got it exactly 375 degrees, nice and hot. It's gonna cook that fish really quick. I've got it just about a third full, maybe a little bit more. I'm using peanut oil because it can fry at a really high temperature. And I'm just gonna simply drop my fillets in there one at a time, very carefully. That's the cornmeal dredge. And then finally, the beer batter. Those will take a couple minutes to cook. Gulf redfish were nearly wiped out in the 70s due to overfishing. Texas passed a redfish bill in 1981 to protect the species. Hatcheries in Texas produce millions of juvenile redfish each year to stock into the bays. These have been in here for about three or four minutes. They're starting to look really good. They're golden brown, crispy. I'm gonna carefully pull them out, drain them a little bit on a rack. And at this point, I'm gonna season them with a little bit more salt, just a sprinkle. This is from my first batch. Just try it out. Mmm. Nice fish, Ethan. Pretty. The greatest thing about redfish is you don't have to have a boat to catch them. Look at the color on that. You can get them in the bay, in the surf. Oh, we've got a redfish, I think. Keeps taking drag on it. It's a nice red. From piers, from jetties. No matter where you catch them, they're always delicious. Seeing all that delicious food makes me want to go hunt, fish, and cook right now. We hope it's done the same for you. And we hope to see you out in the field this year. Thanks for watching Texas Parks and Wildlife. Now let's eat.